In my previous Castlevania video, I spoke about the birth of the Castlevania series. This video is going to focus on that second wave of Castlevania games on the 16-bit machines of the day. I will be looking at the history and the context as we explore the next generation of Castlevania games. The original Castlevania trilogy turned over tens of millions of dollars. So when that raft of new, more powerful games consoles were announced towards the end of the 1980s, Konami saw a raft of new opportunities for what was now their flagship franchise. Super Castlevania 4 was one of the first games Konami would develop for the Super Nintendo, or the Super Famicom in Japan. As was Konami's tradition at the time, Castlevania 4 was developed by a small team with an overlapping skill set. Lead programmer Masahiro Ueno had been with Konami for a few years and he'd previously worked on Metal Gear and Track and Field 2. He acted as team leader and the game's director. Development of Super 4 started in 1989 in parallel with Castlevania 3 on the NES, and it aimed to be more of a streamlined platformer with this laser focus on action. Super is really just acting here as a 16-bit reimagining of the first game. The game features just shy of a dozen levels, a completely linear path, and an identical story to the first Castlevania. Every hundred years as the powers of good wane, Count Dracula gets resurrected through the prayers of the wicked. The year is 1691 and a big black mass out in the wilds of Transylvania sees the Count brought back from the dead along with his demon army. Luckily for us, members of the Belmont clan of vampire hunters are always ready, training for the day that Dracula returns. Simon Belmont, the latest in the long line of Belmonts, sets off for Castle Dracula with his mystical whip to stick Dracula back in the ground for another century. Just like the first game, the opening level does a great job of teaching you the core mechanics. The whip is Simon's main weapon, but whipping candles and enemies will also drop sub-weapons, money and hearts, the latter of which is ammo for those sub-weapons. The sub-weapons again are largely identical to the first game, knife, axe, boomerang, stopwatch, holy water, but now they're mapped to the shoulder button. This is a great way to leverage the new technology and it's just one of many new things which makes Super 4 a worthy successor to the original trilogy. You can now control jumps in mid-air, which really brings Castlevania in line with the game feel of contemporary platformers. Simon can now whip in eight directions, which was originally planned for the NES games, but that feature never made it in. Also, you can wobble the whip around, which doesn't have a tremendous amount of utility, but it does come in surprisingly handy from time to time. Simon can also now use the whip to latch onto walls and swing around the place like Indiana Jones. There is a bit of a knack to this and until you get the hang of it it tends to feel like it's going wrong through no fault of your own. Ueno's team are clearly utilising the feature set of the snares not just out of novelty, but out of a desire to make the best game they can. Once Simon reaches the actual castle, the difficulty really starts to pump up. Enemies start doing a lot more damage, the whip is doing less in return, and we start to see those platforming insta-deaths and those knockback frustrations raise their heads. To be honest, this is expected for what Super is trying to achieve. The resolution to this is to do what you did in the first game. You take your time, you remember enemy patterns. As you might expect, each of these levels has a boss fight at the end. These are mostly your Castlevania mainstays, but there are some fantastic new designs. A giant bat made out of gold coins? Yes please, that's amazing! The finale of the game is a boss rush, and this is the first time that Castlevania 4 really starts to get hard. You might recognise Slogra and Guybon here from Castlevania Series 2. After them, you've got the death fight and then you're on to Big Vlad. Much like the first Castlevania, once you whip his head off, you get a nice credit sequence with some nice obfuscated names due to Konami's policy of enforcing their staff not be credited with their real names. What I can tell you from Moby Games is that the coding was undertaken by Masahiro Ueno, Mitsuru Yaida and Haruki Nitta, and Nitta hadn't worked on anything before. Artwork was undertaken by Kazumishi Ishihara and Satoshi Kushibushi. Ishihara had previously worked on a couple of games, Kushibuchi was another newbie. The pixel art in this game is unreal, world class detail and contrast, the layers and transparency effect, the hardware scaling, mode 7, this is pushing what the SNES was capable of so early on in the console's life. Finally, 
the music. The music in Castlevania 4 is easily in the top five of the entire franchise, and also some of the best in the entire SNES library. Composer Masanori Adachi had previously written the music for 1987's Russian Attack, but that was it. Co-composers Akira Soji and Teru Kudo were both, again, new to the industry, and they hadn't written any game music before. I can't find any specific credits for who wrote what, but Simon Belmont's theme is a banger. The overlapping skills of this multidisciplinary team saw every drop of utility being wrung from the SNES. It's kind of amazing that none of this team had worked on an action platformer before, because their first attempt is still today considered to be one of the best examples of the entire genre. If I said this was the perfect marriage of skill sets, that should let me segue into the fact that Matsuhiro Ueno and Kazumichi Ishihara actually got married during the development of this game. Simply put, Castlevania 4 has better gameplay and better presentation than some of the last games to come out on the SNES, and it was one of the first. The number of good things I have to say about Castlevania 4 is almost never-ending. To call this game a remake of Castlevania 1 does it a massive disservice. Super Castlevania 4 is a quantum leap forward for the franchise, enhancing everything from the first game, and is a fantastic tide mark for the series. Konami's support for home computers had yielded tremendous success in the previous decade, with Konami releasing the first Castlevania on a bunch of different computers. Two years after the release of Super, Konami again released another port of the original Castlevania, this time on the Sharp X68000 home computer. The development team for this was much smaller than Super, and followed Konami's tested formula of a couple of veterans and a handful of new hires. Hideo Ueda led the project and shared coding duties with Manabu Furuya. Ueda was an old guard of the scrolling shooter having worked on Twinbee, Parodius, and Axelay before this, Furuya had worked on nothing. The design team was made up of Hiroyuki Ito, who had worked on some games before, but this was his first major project at Konami, Sunanari Yada, who had worked on Axelay with Hideo Ueda, and Shin Chan, who had worked on nothing. This is much closer to being a remake than Super was, but it is much more than just a port like the Amiga or C64 versions. The advanced hardware gave Castlevania X68000 a higher resolution, more animation frames, way more colours and much richer sound and music, but it retains that slower gameplay and the limited range of movement from the first game. Castlevania X68000 takes familiar locations from Castlevania 1, like the Red Keep and the Clock Tower, it adds in gameplay elements from Super 4, like the rotating spikes and the chain platforms, and it also adds in its own new levels, new music, new enemies, and new bosses. And the boss designs in this game are really solid. The werewolf fighting with bits of the clock is genius. This is also the first time we see the doppelganger, who is now a Castlevania staple. It's largely the same stuff that we saw in Castlevania 1, but it's now got this nice new lick of pain and a few new extra bells and whistles. Just like before, once you're onto the big lad, you whip his head off. But what's cool here is all of his blood comes gushing out and then it coagulates back together to form the curse. And I just love that, man. This could have positioned itself as being the definitive edition of Castlevania, but a lot of the cool stuff introduced in Super, like stair grabs and diagonal whipping, didn't make it into this, and that is a shame. But as is, it's probably the best remake of Castlevania 1 out there, so give it a go if you're curious. By remaking the same game over and over here, these first two games were really about honing the Castlevania experience, so it's the next iterations of the Castlevania franchise that start building on that platform and expanding the lore of the Castlevania universe. Aku Majo Dracula X Chi no Rondo was released on the PC Engine CD, again only in Japan. Now you might not have heard of the PC Engine, but this console sold 8 million units in Japan, making it the second most popular console of the time. No game better represents Castlevania entering the next generation like Rondo of Blood. The team for this game was massive, and it was made up of not only Konami veterans, but Castlevania alumni. It was the first Castlevania game released on the then-revolutionary CD-ROM format. It's the first game with full voice samples, and the first game to feature proper cutscenes. Rondo is also the first true Castlevania sequel from this era, continuing the story 100 years after Dracula got whipped into shape by Simon. The opening cutscene tells us a story, and for authenticity is voiced entirely in German. Now, I don't speak German, but my brother does, so I asked him to translate this for us. 
Niemand glaubte. As per the prophecy in the first Castlevania game, Dracula is brought back to life after his hundred year dirt nap. This time he's brought up by his minion Shaft. Shaft has kidnapped four maidens as like a little anniversary present for him, I guess. And it's up to the latest Belmont, 19 year old Richter, to rescue the maidens and to stop Dracula before he yums them all up. Richter's adventure then takes him across eight different stages all across Wallachia. Some of them are your expected Castlevania staples, but some of them are completely new and original. All of them are well thought out with unique enemy types and hidden alternate routes which unlock branching paths through the game, a bit like Castlevania 3, which is something Ueno said that he would have done in Super 4 if he had had the time. Some stages have secret hidden prison cells housing the maidens that Shaft has kidnapped. The first of these is Maria Renard, who once freed becomes a second playable character. As you can see, there is so much more going on here. Konami are really taking advantage of this massive new storage medium. Music and sound here is just off the scale, no longer hampered by synthesized chip tunes. It might lack maybe the synthy charm of the SNES, but the length and the depths of the tracks here is instantly impressive. Akira Soji had worked on the music for Super and crushes it here, composing Richter's theme, Divine Bloodlines. And Keizo Nakamura, who'd worked on the X68000 game, also contributed a lot of new themes, including my personal favourite, the Ghost Ship. Artists Toshiharu Furukawa and Reika Bando had both worked on the X68000 game. I'm not surprised because these two games have got the most sophisticated pixel work of the series so far. I don't often put a big emphasis on a game's visuals, but the presentation here is just such a big leap forward. Richter gives off a far more energetic vibe than Simon ever did. Richter is faster, he's more athletic, and he is more powerful. In Richter's virile hands, the Belmont Whip is always at full power, so there are no whip upgrades in this game. He also has some great new traversal moves like the backflip, the stair grab, and the moonwalk. The sub-weapons themselves are slightly rebalanced versions of the ones from Castlevania 1, with a new Bible sub-weapon added in, which is very cool. Richter can also perform the new item crash, which is awesome. Pushing the select button unleashes a big full-screen super version of whatever sub-weapon you're using at the cost of a big chunk of hearts. The only thing I think worth critiquing here is that there's no diagonal whipping and that sub-weapons are back to pushing up and attack. The PC engine initially only had a two-button controller, so that probably explains both of these. Rondo is much harder than any of the other games in this video. Some sections are absolutely brutal and some of the bosses are killer, man. The bosses are actually probably the best in the series so far in terms of their animation, their sound and atmosphere. The end game begins with an excellent fight with the Grim Reaper on top of this big haunted pirate ship and then again onto a rush of classic Castlevania baddies. This rush though is insanely hard. You carry the same health over from fight to fight with no health pickups in between. Once you're onto the final boss, it's the same as always. You whip his head off and then you fight the curse. It's the same familiar Castlevania throughout, but there's just newness everywhere. Rondo expands on Castlevania in every conceivable dimension. In fact, if Super didn't exist, I would say that Rondo is the best game in the series so far. I wouldn't say it's worth the price of entry for the physical version, but the action is fantastic, the presentation is by far the best yet, and Richter is the coolest Belmont ever. Suck it, Trevor. Rondo did well on release as well. It's one of the best selling games for the PC Engine and it is still one of the highest rated games on the platform. In an unprecedented move by Konami, the core team from Rondo would stay intact and be put straight to work on making a direct sequel. A young Konami employee by the name of Koji Igarashi happened to be dating a member of the Rondo of Blood team and requested that he be transferred to the Castlevania team ASAP. That and more will be covered in a future video because the story of that ties directly into 1994's Castlevania The New Generation. This is another shakeup to the Castlevania formula. Maybe not as big an upheaval as Simon's Quest was, but this time around there's no castle, it's not set in Transylvania, you're not playing as a Belmont, and the story has a brand new modern setting. Konami were deliberately aiming to create something radical and new here. In fact, this is the first Castlevania game not called Akumajo Dracula in Japan. Instead, it was developed under the title Vampire Killer.
With no boundaries and no expectations, the new generation team just went for it. The new generation is a direct sequel to Bram Stoker's Dracula. Y yeah, Bram Stoker's book just happens to be set about a hundred years after Rondo of Blood, and so it just happens to fit Konami's timeline perfectly. In the book, Quincy Morris kills Dracula, and so Konami just canonized Quincy Morris as a descendant of the Belmont clan, and they made this part of the official Castlevania timeline. Castlevania The New Generation is set in 1917, 20 years after the events of Dracula, and it's about the children of the characters in that book, set during World War I. Dracula's niece, Elizabeth Bartley, triggered World War I so that she could use all the souls of the war dead as this massive sacrifice to bring Dracula back early. Sworn to stop her is the son of Quincy Morris, John, and his pal, Eric Lacard. The manual explains that John inherited the magical Belmont whip from his father. For the first time, actually, we see this whip given its rightful name, the Vampire Killer. The American manual, weirdly enough, misses nearly all of this out. And I think that's a real shame because mixing real world events and the Dracula novel into the Castlevania timeline is just so hugely creative. The new generation thematically shook up the Castlevania formula, and this is reflected in the gameplay too. Unlike the first game where Simon navigates a map of the castle, this time you're trampling all over Europe, following Elizabeth and fighting all the creatures she's recruited to her cause. The game takes place over six different European locations, each with their own unique designs, their own unique level layout, and their own unique enemy types. Some perhaps stereotypical level design, but each one has its own unique flavour, which makes the game fun to progress through. The first stage is Dracula's castle in Wallachia. Whilst this is cool, there's no indication that a world war is raging outside. It's only once we get to Germany that we see industrialist and militaristic elements introduced into the game. It's a shame to choose that specific story concept and then for the locations to not reflect it. There are some fantastic bits of level design though that really sell each location. The rotation and scaling effects on the Italy stage are frankly ludicrous. I didn't even think the Mega Drive was capable of doing this. The beautifully detailed Palace of Versailles again has these great chandelier sections which forces you to look over the whole screen. Konami are squeezing every scrap of power they can out of the Mega Drive. Once you finally track Elizabeth down in... The final level has this crazy, mind-melting, split-screen visual design, which is honestly a little bit too hard, but it is just so imaginative, I can't not love it. And then, of course, accompanying these levels is a great score by the legendary Mishiri Yamane. This was her Castlevania debut, and on balance, the music isn't the best, but honestly, this is a bit of a low forehead argument these days. The Mega Drive was just not as well equipped for music as the SNES was, but what Yamane does with those limitations is extremely extremely cool. The music is punchy and aggressive and it uses the hardware to its fullest. There are all the classic tunes in here but there's some newness too. It might be a little bit rough around the edges but it is hearty and it does the job. The same goes for the platforming. It's clunky, but if anything, this makes the new generation feel like a genuine successor to the first Castlevania game. Sub-weapons have now got their own dedicated button, thanks to the three-button Mega Drive controller, and there is also an Up and C Mega version, similar to Rondo's Item Crash. As well as playing as John, you can also play as Eric Lacard, who uses a cool spear and has his own unique paths through the game. The spear has this nice long range, so again, it doesn't feel out of place in Castlevania, but I just can't get away from that authentic vampire killer experience. John can rope swing anywhere in this game and he can use that to then one shot most enemies. Just like before there is definitely a knack to pulling this off and it isn't easy to get down. It's not surprising that some of these features don't feel completely finished. The game went over budget by quite a margin, partly due to this not being a focus project for Konami, but also due to shoehorning in all this extra stuff. There's whole levels and even two more playable characters that had to be axed because the development time for this just went on for so long. I feel like this lack of finesse stems from the fact that everyone involved was trying to make something wild, and so I just fully respect that ethos. Thank <laughs> you.
Seeing how the Mega Drive was released before all the other consoles in this video, I thought it was weird that Konami took so long to bring Castlevania to Sega. Konami had neglected Sega platforms up until this point. They hadn't released any games for the Master System, and they slowly got on board with the Mega Drive after establishing their output for the SNES. Just to give some context, Sega was massive in PAL territories. The Mega Drive outsold the SNES two to one. The new generation sold about 40,000 copies in Japan, with Famitsu giving it a 28 out of 40. This makes it just about the worst performing Castlevania game in Japan, and the rest of the world were also kind of lukewarm on it as well. History has been kinder to this game than possibly any of the others in this video. The new generation now almost always gets into the top 25 and the top 10 Mega Drive games lists online, and I've seen some people citing this as the best 16-bit Castlevania game. Maybe Castlevania The New Generation isn't a top tier Castlevania game, but it is definitely considered a top tier Mega Drive game. If the 16-bit era ended here, I would say that was a pretty solid outing all round. But there is one more. You could say that Castlevania Vampire's Kiss is just Rondo of Blood ported to the SNES two years later, but trimming Rondo down enough to fit it onto a SNES cartridge was a lot more than just a case of removing the cutscenes and their audio. Whole chunks of the game had to be redesigned or just cut out entirely. The end result should, by rights, be considered an entirely different game a D-make. The generally accepted diatribe online is that Vampire's Kiss is a terrible follow-up to Super Castlevania, and that cutting down Rondo to fit onto the SNES was a horrible job, and Konami are terrible for even trying. The story is more or less the same as Rondo, just simplified a little bit. The manual says Dracula's back, and this time he's kidnapped Richter's sister and girlfriend, so Richter's off to beat him up. That's it. Gameplay is still largely the same as Rondo. Richter still has a stair grab, the backflip, and the item crush, so not too much has been skimmed out there. There are even two endings, depending on whether you rescue Maria and Annette, but unfortunately, Maria isn't playable. Vampire's Kiss is also extremely hard. Richter has very few invincibility frames when taking damage, which means he can actually take damage twice, or sometimes even three times, from things like Medusa heads. The platforming has all the hallmarks of the original NES trilogy, but now it just makes the game feel borderline unfair? It's easy now, I think, to see this game for what it is, but in 1995, people outside of Japan, who had never heard of Rondo of Blood, were expecting a follow-up to Super Castlevania, and so these people were upset when they saw that feature set so stripped back. We've got no in-air control, no multi-directional whipping, the frame rate is really sluggish, the pixel art is really low contrast, it seems to have lost the highs and lows. There are some cool Mode 7 effects thrown in, but honestly, for 1995, this is not good. And here is where you might expect me to say, hey, this was a CD-ROM game on the PC Engine. They had to trim this game down. It's amazing they managed to fit anything onto the SNES. But this doesn't feel like a lot of game shoehorned into a 16 meg car. That's the same size car as Demon's Crest, as Hagane's Super Return of the Jedi, and this game came out after those games. Taken on its merits, the music is very, very good, and actually, this game has the sickest label art of any Castlevania game so far. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm messing, I'm messing. This is still actually a pretty good game. It is far from the best SNES game, but it honestly doesn't deserve the beating that I see it getting from other places online. It suffers being an action platformer released on a console with some of the best action platformers of all time, and it suffers from being released the same year as some of the absolute best games on the SNES. Castlevania Vampire's Kiss is the first real turkey in a franchise which so far had just failed to put a foot wrong. It was going to happen eventually. Even in a race of winners, someone has to come last. Castlevania was instrumental in making Konami one of the biggest game developers on the planet. This generation saw Konami steadily expanding into new markets, from being one of the first third-party developers associated with Sega to becoming Nintendo's biggest third-party publisher. Konami's earnings grew from $10 million in the late 80s to in excess of $300 million in just a few short years, down to the success of Castlevania and a couple of others. To me, this era of Castlevania represents Konami making lots of very big creative decisions. Also, this marks the beginning of Konami establishing long-term teams with a creator-led vision and a long-term strategy. As Konami headed into the 32 the era, this took the Castlevania series to 
dizzying new heights. This era will always be very, very special to me. And if you want to play any of them yourself, then Castlevania 4 is on the SNES Mini, the new generation is on the Mega Drive Mini, Rondo of Blood is on the PC Engine Mini, and also part of Castlevania Requiem for the PS4. Vampire's Kiss isn't on anything, I'm afraid, but it is available on the Virtual Console. Also, Super and the new generation are part of the Castlevania Anniversary Collection on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. Before I finish this video, I just have to say that with these games now getting that much longer and that much more complex, I cannot continue to whack as many games into one video. This was fun to do, but my god, did this take ages to write. I will be continuing to cover the Castlevania series in the future, but you can expect the next video about the next generations to be broken down into more manageable chunks. Thanks so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video. There's more Castlevania stuff on the channel. Until next time, ta-da!